Hello everybody, I welcome you today to go down the rabbit hole in another true crime video. I want my content to feel lighthearted and digestible, but sometimes there's only so much I can do. Because of that, I need to put a little disclaimer. The topic of this video involves sensitive material that may not be suitable for all audiences. This involves sexual assault and murder of many individuals. I want to tell the stories of the victims, inform the public, and also entertain if at all possible. I mean, no disrespect to anyone mentioned, and all the information in this video is my own personal interpretation of information on the case available to the public. Alright, without further ado, let's delve into the solved case of the Golden State Killer. The 1960s were a turbulent time for America. We had many accomplishments, such as our first steps into space, but also had a lot of hardships. Protests were taking place for both civil rights, peace during the Vietnam War, and tons more. One California man would start to rein his hair, instilling fear and hysteria to torment Californians in the late 1960s and to carry on this for decades. The crimes began in spring 1968, with homes being broken into in Exeter, California. Forgive me if I'm pronouncing that wrong. <laughs> Numerous burglaries would follow in the area, dubbing this unknown culprit as the Exeter Ransacker. A police car was also allegedly stolen by this guy from the Exeter Police Department in 1969. Some of these burglaries were considered hot prowl burglaries, meaning that the residents were at home during the time of break-in. Until October 19th, 1971, the Exeter Ransacker had burglarized 24 known times. In 1972 through 1973, serial burglaries began and continued in the eastern portion of Sacramento County, California. Meanwhile, the Exeter Ransacker continued to strike, racking up more burglaries in Exeter. During this time, the known cases of the Exeter Ransacker was up to 37. While roughly three hours north, 30 similar crimes would occur in the Sacramento area. So up until present, the only crimes we know about have been burglaries. Nothing too bad, but still scary. In some of these cases, homeowners or their neighbors spotted a prowler lurking. But unfortunately, this prowler had never been caught. The crimes would unfortunately begin to take a darker turn. Around 1973 or 1974, a 12 year old girl at the time would be picked up by a man wearing an Exeter police uniform, picked her up for skipping school. He claimed he'd take her to her dad, but instead took her north of Visalia and sexually assaulted her inside his patrol car. I do not know that this is for sure a 100% thing that happened, as these claims were made by the now adult woman, but she felt she had the power to speak up about it after his arrest. I will get back to his arrest in a bit, but for the sake of following this timeline, I will continue. In May of 1973, a prowler was spotted in Visalia, which is a city close to Exeter. In the same month, there is a failed abduction of a 16-year-old girl. In June of the same year, a home was ransacked in Fasalia. This brings us to our next criminal, the Fasalia Ransacker. We now have the Exeter Ransacker and the Fasalia Ransacker. This is when crimes would take a sharp turn, away from just burglaries and into more horrifying crimes. By spring 1974, the Exeter Ransacker had accumulated up to 44 known burglaries or crimes, and the Fasalia Ransacker, 24. There are numerous reports of a prowler. In this area of time, a family dog was bludgeoned to death in a burglary. I don't know about you guys, but personally, I think someone has to be a real detached monster to harm any sort of animal. It's disgusting. And Exeter, October 5th, 1974, almost midnight, someone threw a brick through a window at the home of Lorraine Lambert, hitting her three-year-old son. Four days later in Fasalia, there is an attempted rape, but the woman is able to repel her attacker. November that same year, high school student Jennifer Lynn Armour went missing. Nine days later, her body is found. She had been sexually assaulted. In April the following year, a 16-year-old girl was offered a ride, then sexually assaulted in a rural area in Visalia. She is dropped off at an intersection. September 10th, 1975. Beth Snelling, age 16, hears a noise outside of her bedroom at 7 p.m. The following night at 2.17 a.m., Beth's father, Claude Ray Snelling, was murdered in a home invasion. The intended target was supposedly his daughter, Beth. Supposedly, the gun used in that murder was stolen 11 days prior in a burglary where the culprit had made a path 
of the owner's underwear down the hallway. For months, Beth Snelling and her brother slept in her mother's bed. At this time, the Vasily ransacker is up to 94 known cases. October 16th, 1975, a previous victim of a burglary receives an obscene phone call. This victim wouldn't be the only one to receive obscene phone calls. Carrying on, Tuesday, October 21st, an Exeter police officer was visiting family in Rancho Cordova in Sacramento, California for a birthday. That same night, a mother and her two daughters were attacked in Rancho Cordova. Near the home where a dog was found disemboweled the year before, a man threatened the woman and girls with a knife, tying the mother and older daughter and tying up the seven-year-old daughter in another room. He repeatedly sexually assaulted the mother and teen daughter before also sexually assaulting the child in the other room. He ransacked the house, only taking two jade rings. It's needless to say that the police were really trying to do what they could to catch this culprit and stop the attacks. Since the homicide of Claude Snelling, the Facelia Police Department had been sending out patrols to stake out and catch this killer, who despite being wanted for murder, had continued to burglarize and peep at residents in the same areas of town. If it wasn't already inferred previously. I must explain that he would sometimes stalk the homes he would strike upon next. Oftentimes he had ransacked the neighbors as well. In February of that year, he had ransacked the neighbors of a future victim while they were out for the evening. In July, a 19-year-old living in the residence next door interrupted a burglar coming down from an apartment the family was renting out from upstairs. This woman later noticed that people were outside of her bedroom and bathroom windows, so the police advised the family to call when shoe prints appeared outside the home. In December, sure enough, shoe prints are found. The police were called and determined that these were the areas they would stake out. The next day on December 10th, 6 p.m., Officer William McGowan was positioned in the garage of the house next door to the victim, this being the one mentioned in February, with his partner staking out in the residence across the street. At 6.30 p.m., a home was burglarized about half a mile away from where police were waiting. Two and a half hours later, when the officers initially staked out, at 8.30 p.m. Officer McGowan noticed a shadowy figure outside of the garage he was waiting in. The culprit creeps up to the garage in a crouched position against the shrubbery before peeking into the garage. He did not notice the officer inside and started to make his way to the back gate of the home. The officer rose up from his spot and began pursuing the culprit. As the culprit began tampering with the lock on the gate, the officer turned on his flashlight aimed at the ransacker's head. He let out some, oh no, oh my gods, in a frantic high-pitched tone. He took off running, jumping over the gate and landing in the backyard. The ransacker begged the cop not to hurt him, while the cop sternly told him to stop or the cop would shoot. The man put his hands up, but then reached into his pocket and whipped around before the officer could react, firing a shot. The shot hit McGowan's flashlight, bouncing off into his eye. The ransacker got away. At this time, the Vasily ransacker had accumulated up to nearly 150 cases, making it to 151 by October the following year. 151 cases between the summer of 1973 and 1976. From May 1973 till December 1975, he was known as the Vasily ransacker. However, he would earn himself a new name. In June 1976 until July of 1979, he would be dubbed the East Area Rapist. In 1976, our culprit moved to the Sacramento area. His crimes only escalated. In the neighborhoods he targeted, it is believed that he extensively scouted them prior to his attacks. He would prowl in yards, peek into windows, and even call victims to learn their daily routines before selecting a victim. He appeared to prefer to stalk middle-class neighborhoods in search of women who were alone in single-story homes. Typically, he would aim for these homes that are next to a creek, or a trail, a school, or any open space that would provide him an easy method to escape afterwards. He was seen numerous times, but always successfully escaped. Sometimes he would enter homes of future victims to prep for his attack by unloading guns or unlocking windows or doors or hiding ligatures for later use to tie up victims. He initially targeted women, as mentioned before, either alone or with children, but eventually he preferred attacking couples. He was known to break in and scare the sleeping victims awake by shining a flashlight in their face and then threatening them with a handgun. They were then bound by said ligatures he'd either hidden, brought with him, or found at the home. He blindfolded and gagged them with towels ripped into strips. Female victims were forced to tie up their partner before she herself was tied by the culprit. The next bit is quite a well-known bit for reasons you can 
probably guess, but he would separate these couples. He would stack dishes on the back of the man, threatening that if he heard them rattle, he would kill everyone in the house. That's when he would sexually assault the woman repeatedly. He was known to spend hours doing that, or even hours ransacking the home. He would take his time, he would eat food in the fridge, drink beer, and still go back and repeatedly assault the woman. When he was finished, he would creep away, believing to have escaped by a series of yards or parks, schoolyards, creeks, open spaces, etc. They kept him off the street before getting on a bike or a car and heading home. He did this in a way that would leave victims unsure of when he left. In between June 1976 and July 1979, 50 of those attacks occurred in Sacramento and nearby areas. After this time, the East Area Rapist becomes the original Night Stalker, with his MO changing to murder. The culprit moved to Southern California, with his first crime after moving happening in Santa Barbara County in October of 1979. He attempted murder. During 1979 to 1986, he murdered on seven different occasions. Robert Offerman, Deborah Manning, Charlene Smith, Lemon Smith, Keith Harrington, Patrice Harrington, Manuela Witham, Sherry Domingo, Gregory Sanchez, and Janelle Cruz all lost their precious lives to this monster. At this time, it wasn't known that the Exeter Ransacker, the Fazalia Ransacker, and the East Area Rapist, and the original Night Stalker were all one and the same. It was one man. In early 2013, writer Michelle McNamara dubbed him the Golden State Killer to raise more awareness of the case, and from here on out is what we will call him. His crimes ended in the 80s, but his psychotic behavior did not. He continued making phone calls harassing victims until 2001. He would threaten to assault them again, threaten to kill them, called them vulgar things, etc. At this time, I'll play one of his recorded phone calls harassing one of the victims, but I must warn you that it's very disturbing and be warned. Here it goes. To rewind a bit, it is not known that all of these offenders were the same man. It wasn't until 2001 that the East Area Rapist was connected to the original Night Stalker. These links were primarily due to similarities in MO, but were later linked by DNA. Over 100 burglaries, over 50 rapes, and 13 murders. The suspect was finally caught. Let's talk about how this was done. So as we know, technology wasn't the same in the 70s and 80s and such as it is today. It isn't as simple to catch this man as we may think it is. Before getting to how this case was cracked, let's talk about the suspect profile that the police cooked up for the Golden State Killer. His physical characteristics, based on crime scene evidence, he is a white male, 5 foot 10 inches tall, slender slash athletic build, size 9 or 9.5 shoe, type A blood, and a non-secretor, meaning his sperm does not contain blood group antigens, and is physically agile. Here is a list of probable characteristics I'm going to read from his Wikipedia page. An emotional age equivalent to 26 to 30 year old at the time the murders began in 1979. Engaged in paraphilic behavior and brutal sex in his personal life. Engaged in sex with prostitutes. Had some knowledge of police investigation methods and evidence gathering techniques that I want to highlight. Sexually functional, capable of ejaculation with consenting and non-consenting partners. Dressed well and would not stand out in upscale neighborhoods. Lived or worked near Ventura, California in 1980. Good physical condition. Skilled, experienced cat burglar and may have begun as such. Had a criminal, criminal record as a teenager, which was expunged. Had some means of income, but did not work in the early morning hours. Hated women for perceived wrongs. Intelligent and articulate. Neat and well organized in his personal life and drove a well-maintained car. Peeped in windows of many people who were not attacked. Self-assured and confident. But finally, finally, after all these years, an answer would be found. On the Thursday, March 13th, 1980 murder of Lemon Smith and the rape murder of Charlene Smith, DNA was collected through the use of genetic genealogy. Searching on a site similar to like Ancestry.com or 23andMe, investigators identified distant relatives of the culprit. It included family members related to his great, 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 great grandfather who lived in the 1800s. With this information, the investigators constructed around 25 family trees trying to find the culprit. The tree that eventually linked them to their man had around a thousand people, but over a few months with clues such as age, sex, and place of residence to rule out suspects, they eliminated these people off their list until they got to one. 
That one was, at the time, 72-year-old Joseph James D'Angelo Jr. In addition to that, the DNA was ran through a different program to find that the suspect would have blue eyes. Out of six remaining suspects at the time, D'Angelo was the only one with blue eyes, but they had to link the man to the DNA directly. Police had to wait, being very careful, for anything with his DNA on it to arise that they could help themselves to essentially to connect him to the crime. Eventually they got their, they got their sample. Police found a piece of tissue in the suspect's trash with DNA that provided a 100% match to the DNA of the Golden State Killer. Finally, after all these years, in 2018, serial burglar, rapist, and murderer Joseph D'Angelo was arrested. Let's talk about D'Angelo really quick. November 8th, D'Angelo was born in Bath, New York in 1945. He attended high school in Rancho Cordova, playing baseball for a JV team. He did not attend high school for what should have been his senior year, and in 1964 got his GED instead in June. That September, his parents divorced. That same month, he enlisted in the US Navy for four years. In 1965, he was a fireman in the Navy on the USS Canberra serving on large ships that bombed the Viet Cong from a distance. He was deployed three times on the Canberra. In 1968, he was a second-class damage controlman on the USS Piedmont. In September 1968, his enlistment period had been fulfilled. He receives $175 a month for college, which in today's equivalency is almost $1,300 as of 2020, so long as he meets the Navy's enrollment requirements. He began attending Sierra College that September. In his sophomore year, he met and started dating another sophomore named Bonnie Conwell. He was 23 and she was 18. In May of 1970, the couple got engaged. In winter of 1971, Joe and Bonnie enroll in California State University. In the spring of that year, after pressing her to help him cheat in school, supposedly, Bonnie breaks up with D'Angelo. Days after said breakup, she sees him holding hands with an unfamiliar girl in his psychology class. A few more days later, she was sleeping when she heard something on her bedroom window. She opens the curtain to see him standing there with a handgun. Joe tells her to get dressed and that he was taking her to Reno, but Bonnie got her father, who told her to lock herself in the bathroom. Her dad talked him down for around two hours before he left and the family returned to bed. Now terrified, Bonnie dropped out for a semester and changed her major. The next year, in 1972, the first victim makes it to the papers in February. Break-ins and batterings of dogs were reported around this time. Bonnie gets married in August 12, 1972, to an accountant. In 1973, D'Angelo graduates with a bachelor's in criminal justice. He then enrolled in an internship for the police department in Roseville, California. He joined the Exeter Police Force in May. He helped with crimes involving burglaries. November 10, 1973, he marries a woman named Sharon Huddle. In 1976, he is an officer for the Auburn, California Police Department. Prior to that, for three years, he was an officer for the Exeter Police Force. July 2, 1976, he was caught shoplifting a hammer and dog repellent. He faked a heart attack and fought store security until they had to tie him to a chair, where when deputies arrived, they found him rolling around in his chair, talking in circles, screaming incoherently. Why this did not ring a million alarm bells? I don't know. He was, however, cited, suspended, and later fired from the police force. He had 15 days to appeal the firing, which he eventually did. He is no longer a police officer at the time, but receives federal funding for retraining. Let's summarize that. D'Angelo has a history with the Navy and was actively a police officer for the majority of the years subsequent to his crimes. He was married, and the significance to his broken engagement to Bonnie was that during a sexual assault, he was cursing, saying how he hated Bonnie, which the the victim reported. You know, years after the breakup occurred, three of his years as an Exeter police officer, he was a burglary unit police officer. It is said during his crimes that after working in Exeter, he would do his assaults and crimes before, before returning home late at night when his wife was sleeping. In 1980, the couple moved to Citrus Heights, which is where he would eventually be arrested in 2018. The couple had three daughters. The couple separated in 1991 and Sharon filed for a divorce in 2018. His employment during the 1980s is unknown, but it is theorized that he worked in some sort of construction or painting due to samples of paint chippings or something like those collected at crime scenes. What is known though is that he worked as a truck mechanic at a place called Save Mart Supermarkets in a distribution center in Roseville, California until he retired. 
And I, I just want to state for the record, while he was leaving the Navy, while he was in school, while he was a police officer, he was doing these crimes, and it's despicable. And also, really ironic time for him to be arrested and charged due to current events, you know, with the ACAB and all. But I want to slip in there really quickly that a lot of people, not all, but a lot of people who do these kind of crimes are the kind of people who are quote-unquote pillars of the community. They're people who are supposed to trust, they're people with power, people who we think that that we should respect. And of course that doesn't mean that all people like himself should be, you know, not trusted. Like not all like family men who are like priests or police officers or whatever, not all of them, you know, shouldn't be trusted. But it's it's worth taking a look at. It's worth being careful about. And please, 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 any of you out there, if you suspect anything weird going on, please trust your instincts. Please report any information you might have to police if it arises. Whatever you need to do to keep yourself or the public safe. Anyways, without further ado, let's now head to present day, where he has been linked to the crimes and arrested. Apparently, puts up an act of being a frail old man supposedly is intentionally starving himself to appear frail but none of that matters because the crime still happened and as of June 2020 he pled guilty in trial and has been sentenced his admission of guilt saved him from the death penalty but earned him a life sentence with no chance of, of parole and it also brings justice to many troubled souls living or not living half a century in the making one horrible man terrorized the communities of California hundreds suffered at his hands a husband, a father, a brother, a respected police officer in charge of protecting, and also a gruesome monster, a serial killer. Let this time be a fresh air and release for every victim. Every single soul, living or dead, who has suffered at this man's hands now have their justice. This was the story of the Golden State Killer. Thank you guys so much for watching. Sorry if that was a rough, but hopefully at the very least, it was interesting and informative. There's so much more information that it's difficult to squeeze into one video, so I highly recommend further researching yourself if you have time or checking out some documentaries if you're interested. If you like reading, there are plenty of books you could check out, such as one, I'll Be Gone in the Dark. Let me know your guys' thoughts. As usual, any questions, comments, concerns over the topic of the video or the art in the video are welcome below. Be sure to subscribe if you enjoyed this video so we can catch you in the next one. Check out these wonderful featured artists. As I do at the end of my videos, I feature some artists. And if you would like to be featured yourself, please join our Discord server link below and have your art featured as well. Thanks for peeking at this video and supporting me. See you in the next one. Bye!